Greetings and welcome. I'm Carol Masser, your host for the final day of the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. Today's session is focused on global health. Humanity depends on it. None of us are safe unless everyone is safe. Yet almost everywhere, public health is chronically underfunded. Now, to begin the day, we bring you the next in our series of Global Voices. We asked frontline workers and healthcare systems around the world to tell us about the challenges they faced during this pandemic. Take a listen now to the experience of a nurse we met in Johannesburg. worst experience with COVID was not getting it myself and being scared that I'm going to leave my family in trouble. I think it was more that I was going to infect my 75 year old mom that was a cardiac and a diabetic or that other, other family members were going to get sick and die because of me. Losing three of my family members within three weeks of each other was hard. We couldn't mourn together. In regards to what the general public behave like, I'm hoping and praying that the second wave that comes along does not destroy any other family like the way COVID destroyed my family. The sad part for us was we believe in the touch policy in our department. We hug our patients, we love our patients. They didn't have that personal touch where we would hug them and say, it's fine, we are with you. The other thing that, that really worries me, if first world countries are having a problem with the economies, what is going to happen to third world countries? As it is, we are hit with all other types of illnesses like HIV, TB. For COVID to come and destroy our setup is even worse because we've had many patients that did not even come back for the regular medication because they were worried about COVID and now have resistance. For my colleagues and for all other frontline workers, I say thank you so much for being there because my family members really appreciated your care. Thank you very much. and some heartfelt comments there. Well, next up, we have a spotlight on virus hunters. They are the scientists who are trying to head off the next pandemic. Bloomberg New Economy Forum Editorial Director Andy Brown sat down with speakers Peter Dasek. He's president of the EcoHealth Alliance. Professor Wang Lifa, Duke and U.S. Medical School professor at the Program in Emerging Infectious Diseases. And Anne Ramoyne, professor of epidemiology at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Andy. COVID-19 has claimed over one million lives and brought the global economy to its knees. How were we so unprepared for this catastrophe? Scientists who study zoonotic viruses, pathogens that jump from animals to humans, have been sounding the alarm for years about the risk of infection from bats. Obviously, we didn't take their warnings seriously enough. So what can we do to predict and prevent the next pandemic? I'm Andy Brown, the editorial director of the Bloomberg New Economy. Joining me today are three leading scientists who've spent their careers hunting viruses. Dr. Peter Dasak is the president of EcoHealth Alliance, a US-based organization that conducts research and outreach programs on global health, conservation, and international development. Dr. Anne Ramoyne is a professor of epidemiology at the UCLA School of Public Health. Dr. Wang Lianfa is the director of the program in emerging infectious diseases at Duke NUS Medical School, Singapore. Welcome. You're among the world's leading virus hunters. It's no exaggeration to say that you stand between humanity and the next pandemic. My first question, could we have prevented this one? Peter, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, of course we could. 
look, we, we knew um, where the next emerging disease was going to come from. We've, we've known that for 10 years or more. We know where these hotspots are. We know the sorts of behaviours that lead to pandemics, you know, um, cutting down forests, building roads into remote areas, coming into contact with wildlife, hunting them, eating them, trading them in an unprecedented way around the world. And, and we've known about this. We, we even had the programmes in place in a very small way um, to begin to understand how we can stop those behaviours, how we can work with local communities, understand what the incentives are, and help them do things in a safer way to protect their health that then protects our health. The problem is we weren't doing this on a big enough scale. We didn't take it seriously enough, despite the warnings, despite the red flags. And do you think we'll ever get to the bottom of where COVID-19 came from? What's the most likely theory? Well, right now, the, there is some evidence. There's pretty strong evidence that bats carry hundreds of related viruses, including the closest known relatives to SARS-CoV-2, that bats, particularly in South China and in the bordering countries, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, um, that's where these viruses tend to evolve. And that's where people come into contact with them regularly. We, we estimate over a million people a year are exposed to bat origin coronaviruses in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, normally they don't do much, probably a little bit sick. This time, somehow the virus got into the, the big cities of, of central China, Wuhan, in the wildlife markets, exploded and spread around the world. Lin Fa, there are hundreds of thousands of viruses circulating in bats. How does COVID-19 rank in terms of deadliness? Well, in terms of deadliness, you know, for the virus which already know jump from bats to humans, COVID-19 is not the most deadly, right? We have Ebola, we have Hanger and Nipper. You know, Nipper virus, you know, uh, on average has a case fatality of 50 to 70 and in certain outbreaks, 100%. Whereas the COVID-19, we're talking about, you know, maybe one to 3% at most. So certainly it's not the most deadly but looks like it's very transmissible. Yeah, so that's two different sort of uh, uh, scales, right? In terms of fatality, it's not on top. Okay, time for a prediction. Anne, when will the next pandemic strike and where is it most likely to come from? Well, we don't know exactly where the next pandemic will strike. It could strike anywhere, but we do know where the hotspots in the world are. We've all been doing research on emerging infectious diseases in this group for the last several decades. We know that wet markets are, are important places. We know that places where hunting, in particular commercial hunting is happening, um, is, are important. We know that places in Asia, places in Africa, where people really live at the animal-human interface are important places where viruses are easily able to jump species and then spread. The bottom line is, is that viruses don't need passports, they don't need visas, they can move easily without any detection, so we always have to be ready. And the problem is, is that we haven't had the kind of early warning system and investment in this kind of early warning system that we've needed uh, from the very beginning. We've been able to spend a lot of money uh, preventing uh, wars and to be able to, to invest in systems to, to, to help us uh, protect against invasion from our perceived enemies. But what we don't think about is invasion from viruses. And I think that now we're all starting to think about this um, on, a, on a global scale, because all of us who've been working on viruses have been thinking about this for a very long time, that we really need to be able to invest in protecting ourselves from viruses. This is the next frontier. As Bill Gates said, it's microbes, not missiles. Let me stay with you for the next question, Anne. Every time a pandemic comes along, people start shouting, this is a wake-up call. But nobody ever wakes up. We've had SARS and MERS and Ebola. HIV has killed more than 30 million people around the world, yet we always seem to be unprepared. Every time it comes as a surprise. Why should the COVID-19 be any different? Well, I think it's, a, it's an issue of, of remembering it's much easier, as my, as my father-in-law used to say, it's much easier to stay out of trouble than it is to get out of trouble. And we are definitely in trouble right now. 
um, and we're paying the price. If we had invested in these systems early on, we would not be paying the kind of price we're paying right now. I think it, it may have been Peter. I don't remember where I who who I can attribute this to, but there have been many um, studies that have shown that the cost of dealing with a pandemic can be 500 times greater than preventing a pandemic. And that's where we need to be, be focusing on right now. It's never too late to, to get started. The earlier we start, the more prevention we'll have. But what we do know as humans continue to encroach upon uh, in, into, into forests, um, and into places where they're in greater contact with species, that the that the need for consumption of animals increases. We are going to be seeing more and more of this, uh, and and we have precedents. Um, those who are I there, the, we also know that people have said before. There's a famous um, philosopher who said, "Those who forget the past are destined to repeat it." And so we really need to be able to learn from our lessons now to be able to prevent what could be happening in the future. Linfa, how can you possibly track down all of the viruses that circulate in bats? Second, how do you know which ones will be deadly for humans? And third, which ones should we prepare vaccines and therapeutics for? Yeah, so that's a, a very tough question, right? To start with, how do we know how many there? You know, Peter and I have been working with a lot of scientists in the world. And then secondly, to predict which one is ready to jump is uh, even more difficult. I think, you know, with the scientific tools we have, if we have enough money, Peter and I strongly believe we can catalog most of the virus, good to 90%, 99% of the virus in mammals, if we have the will internationally. Then the second one is to predict which one is ready to jump. I think that's going to be more difficult, but we have learned enough lessons in the last three decades, right? Coronavirus, you know, three, three really large outbreaks just in two decades. So that's certainly in the top of the list, the filovirus and the paramyxovirus. These are the three top targets. But I think, you know, we can do better without even 100% accuracy in predicting that. We don't need to make a vaccine for every virus in bats to, in order to win the war. I always say that all about is the international collaboration and we get a ready, like Anne is saying that if we're ready, then even if we can detect the early transmission event to an intermediate host, for example, before they go to human, that's better because we don't have a human. But even if we get to human, just like COVID-19, you know, if early December we, sense that we detect that, I think we can prevent the COVID-19 outbreak. So there are three different levels we can do much better. And so far, I think we don't have enough funding and we don't have enough the public will to do better. I always say in the science, of course, we can improve. But personally, I have been in the game for 30 years and I have watched the science has progressed so much, but the political will and the collaboration is left behind. I think that that's where I think we need to do better. I mean, can I chime in on this a little bit? I, look, we, we, we have a challenge. We, have, we know there are a bunch of viruses out there that we don't know about. We don't know the, the identity of. So we went to China um, 15 years ago, working with Linfa and others um, at Wuhan Institute of Virology. We caught bats, we looked at them, and we said, how many viruses can we find? We found hundreds of different strains. But we didn't just say, okay, there's lots of viruses out there. We actually sequenced the viral genome and then use that in the lab to recreate the spike proteins of those viruses, the, the proteins they use to bind to human cells. Those spike proteins were then used to test the drug remdesivir to see how broad it is, how broadly effective it is. So there is proof of concept that you can go from finding these new viruses, assessing which ones look dangerous, and then trialing them out in the lab to test new vaccines and drugs. And look, if, if the cost of doing that is high, we estimate about you know over a billion dollars to identify 70% of the unknown viruses. There are about 1.7 million unknown viruses on the planet. Um, that's a lot of money, but put that against the cost of a, a single pandemic like COVID, trillions of dollars to the global economy, hundreds of thousands of deaths already and more to come. Um, it is worth spending that money. We estimate if you reduce the number of cases by 1%, you get a nine to one return on investment. That's a pretty good odds. And, and I think that there's a willingness now on the planet to do something different. I think we've got to get out there and run that program and show 
the value in reduced mortality and reduced economic loss. Peter, did we just get unlucky this time? Animal virus cross to humans all the time. Few people die. End of story. What made COVID-19 the real monster that it is? Well, you know, we got unlucky with the great influenza in 1918. We got unlucky again with so-called Spanish flu in the 1950s. We got unlucky again with HIV. We've, we've gotten unlucky more and more often over the last few decades. There's a reason for that. Look, we're making our own luck because we're continuing to um, expand across the planet. We're, we're pretty, doing pretty unsustainable things in terms of land use change, hunting of wildlife, globalized travel and trade. We're creating the perfect setup for a pandemic and they're coming quicker. You know, we've tracked emerging disease origins for the last few decades. There are about 500 of them and we can show that they're happening more frequently. Um, they're, they're spreading quicker. They're killing more people. And they're crashing our economies more substantially. This, this economic hit follows SARS at about 30 to $50 billion. Um, follows um, swine H1N1 at a few hundred million dollars. The, these outbreaks are expensive. They're unsustainable at this point. So let's do something about the underlying drivers. And what are the lessons from the early failures to snuff out COVID-19 at source in Wuhan? As a group of virus hunters, you knew about this weeks before the rest of the world did, right? Well, the lessons learned are that people don't communicate and that the, there's no system in place. It shouldn't be just a little bit of, of chatter between, uh, between laboratories and between scientists. We need a global system that has great communication. We've talked about before, we've talked about these issues of how people need to be connected better. They need to communicate better. In 9-11, what we learned uh, from 9-11 was that the FBI and the CIA and all of the, the, the global uh, systems that were supposed to protect us and to watch for uh, terrorist um, for, for terrorist activity were not communicating with each other. And we have the same problem right now. We have labs all over the world that are very capable of detecting viruses and to be able to do the work, underfunded but capable of doing this work. And we don't have a system in place where labs are able to communicate and to be able to share information and to be able to move quickly. Um, this is one of the biggest problems that we've, that we've identified and one of the things that we really should learn and heed the lessons right now. If we had better communication, we would have been able to mobilize much more quickly. We also don't have that kind of global force to be able to go in and to be able to help a country be able to mitigate spread at the source. This happened in China where there was a lot of capacity in place, but if this had started someplace else with less capacity, we would have had a much bigger problem and we would know much less about this virus right now. I think another very important lesson that you need, that we should all be learning right now is that research needs to start immediately at the same time as containment, because that's how you're gonna learn how to be able to mitigate, how to be able to stop spread, contain it, and, and, and be able to understand how to be able to move then into the next phase of drugs, therapeutics, vaccines. If government said to you, spend as much as you like on preventing the next pandemic, what would you spend it on? And where would you concentrate your resources? Again, I come back to say, you know, science is still evolving, but I personally feel, you know, I work in this field, we have enough platforms and enough technique to do early detection and prevention. The key is that, uh, you know, I think Anne is mentioning that, that the lack of the communication. I feel like we also need a legal framework. You know, I used to work in Australia, you know, in the animal health field. Uh, Australia is a big country and I work in the national facility down in South. But there is a legal frame to say that if vets see some kind of unusual cluster of disease, if you cannot diagnose, you are born by law within 48 hours, you have to report to government and to the central lab. Now, if we do that to human health, because, you know, I'm in Singapore now, you know, uh, even in USA, California, you know, we doctors see these unusual cases all the time. Now, I think uh, people can accuse us of being panic and alarm sort of, you know, uh, raising. But for me, I always say when you're dealing with emerging infectious diseases, I prefer to be overreacting rather than underreacting. So if I have all the money, first of all, we'll strengthen research and, uh, you know, improve our detection platform. 
and go to active surveillance rather than passively. Once we have a, you know, right now we have a COVID-19, then we ask where it's from. It's too late, right? We don't have the sample collected, you know, beforehand. And then certainly most importantly is really the political will from the national level to the international level is that I feel like, you know, we are at a stage if you don't investigate unusual cases and small clusters, you will end up like COVID-19. For example, I always say early December or even maybe late November, if the, the hospital you will hand smell something unusual, if they're bound by certain laws to report and the national international team got involved, I am really confident we could have control it, you know, without suffering right now. Peter, as humans, we've made ourselves more vulnerable to zoonotic diseases by pushing into the wild. What's more important, do you think, in heading off the next pandemic? Changing human behavior or identifying potentially lethal viruses? Yeah, I think we've got to do two really critical things. You know, I, I go back to that terrorist analogy, the 9-11 analogy. Prior to 9-11, um, terrorist Terrorist um, um, attacks happened and we dealt with them. We cleaned up and we moved on. 9-11 was a transformational change. And, and, and what it said to us was the impact of a terrorist attack is too much. We need to do something radical. So what did the U.S. government do? They tracked every single phone call coming into the U.S., a pretty, pretty revolutionary piece of surveillance. Why aren't we doing that with pandemics? We, we've now hit a transformative change with COVID-19. We should be listening to the rumors of outbreaks on the ground around the world. Why are we sitting here knowing there are 1.7 million unknown viruses and not bothering to go out and identify them? We don't, we don't do that with terrorists. We go to every single terrorist cell. We listen to what they're saying. When we hear the rumors of an attack, we send in the drones. We need the same mentality for pandemics. And you know, by, by looking at that, we also look at what causes the radicalization of terrorism. And, and a, a similar analogy to pandemics, when we push our, our roads into rainforests and when we industrialize the wildlife trade, we're creating this incredible risk. We know it's a risk. We don't bring the surveillance in at the same time. That's what we need to do. We need to look at our own behavior, our own consumption practices, and at least protect against pandemic risk within them and also reduce them. That's how we're gonna get away from what we're in now, which is the pandemic era. Peter and Lin Fao, we're out of time. Let's hope that governments around the world heed your warnings. 